Hey, good morning and welcome. Thank you for connecting on this uh, session where we journey through the Book of Acts and we will also study about the life of Apostle Paul. Um, so far, we have seen the first few chapters in the book. So we're going to go um, further and see all the occurrences that take place uh, in the early church. So let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Uh, maybe I'll just start. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is a privilege, O oh God, to have your word, to study your word, Lord, to uh, Lord encounter you through your word, Father God, and be transformed by it. Lord, we ask for your grace this morning. Lord, we ask for your presence. Lord, we ask for your power, O oh God, even as we learn your word, we pray, God, that each of us, Lord, in our life circumstances and situations will experience you the way people experienced you, Father, in the book of Acts. Thank you once again, Lord, for your goodness and faithfulness in our lives. We bless you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, till now, we have covered up to Acts chapter 4. And what we saw in Acts chapter 4 um, is the, uh, like, almost a trial, isn't it, of uh, Peter and John for doing something good. They were only walking in the power of God and they were um, accused of conspiring against the uh, powers and authorities of the time. And uh, when such a thing happened, we also noticed how by the power of the Holy Spirit, um, they were so bold, uh, facing a council, facing leaders, facing opposition, and we saw how God made a way for them to actually come out of the situation and their strong connect with the rest of the brethren or the body of Christ. And we saw how they went back, reported all the events that took place. And together, they responded with prayer in one accord. And as they sought the Lord, God's power was demonstrated among them. Uh, uh, the earth shook, uh, the scriptures tell us in verse 31 and uh, in this manner they strengthened themselves in the lord at a very difficult time and uh, further to that we continue to see the features of the early church and we saw how the church was so caring and so kind generous towards people who were in need people even sold their possessions and they gave it to the apostles uh, it is likely that the apostles provided leadership in the spiritual matters as well as um, other administrative aspects. So when the people came and gave their, um, their offerings to the apostles, they would have even managed the finances of the church. So this is how uh, we, we see the structure of the church evolving through this time. And we stopped at a point where we were introduced to a new individual by the name of Barnabas. And uh, we noticed that he was somebody who had uh, a great background. So he is a Levite and uh, also he seems to be uh, a rich person because he possessed uh, land, it says. And uh, also we noticed that uh, his name was called as the son of encouragement. Now, even Barnabas was someone who came, he um, sold the land and gave the money to the apostles. So this is the point where we have stopped. Now, we will continue and see what really happens in this caring, sharing church uh, setting. So let's start reading from Acts chapter 5. Uh, I request someone to read from verse 1 all the way till verse 11. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a position, and he kept back part of the proceed. His wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, 
Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself while it remained? Was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not, not in your own control? Why have you uh, conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man ro arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what, has hap what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much? She replied, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her lust. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church, upon all who heard these things. Thank you, Zeli. Um, so we've seen a portion of uh, this book where some new people are introduced to us. And this is a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. The, the story of uh, Ananias and Sapphira is a, uh, a really disturbing one because though they were part of this church where miracles were taking place and God's um, you know, abundant grace was seen upon this church, uh, they did something which was not aligned to the nature of God. They lied to God. And uh, uh, that brought them into trouble to an extent where both of them lost their lives. So what happened is that during this time when people were willing to share their possessions, Ananias and Sapphira also sold their possessions. Um, it is important for us to note that there was no compulsion by the apostles for people to do such a thing. But through the generosity of their heart, people were doing it. Um, so another important lesson for us today in our churches is that we don't impose you know, giving uh, upon people and say, you have to give, you have to give so much, or you, know, you need to sell your possessions and give, because the early church never made a demand on the people. So it was a, uh, like a free will offering, or it was something that they did uh, because of what good God put on their own hearts. So Ananias and Sapphira made their decision. They sold a possession, and um, you know they kept back a certain portion, and the, the remaining they came and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Again, the laid it at the apostles' feet means that it was submitted to the apostles for um, their decisions regarding the money. Now, what happened is. Uh, Peter asked Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? So it is likely that Ananias claimed that he has given all the money that came from the selling of their possession to the apostles. So the problem was not that he kept a little bit back for himself, but the problem is that he... Uh, made it look like he is giving everything to the apostles. So there uh, is uh, a lack of integrity and a lack of honesty uh, in what Ananias is doing. And also another important part that we must notice is the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the people as well as the leaders of the church. So there is a word of knowledge that Peter is functioning with. Uh, how would Peter know that Ananias has done something like this? Uh, if he just comes up to Peter and says, hey, here's all the money that I got from selling my land. But Peter has come to know by the Holy Spirit. And that's what verse 3 says. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? How did Peter know? 
a word of knowledge. So Peter recognized through the operation of a gift of the Holy Spirit that Ananias was lying. So he is confronting him and he is telling him, look, uh, it's because of Satan that you're doing this. You're influenced by Satan and you kept back a part of the price of the land for yourself. Um, and he also is questioning him and he's saying, when it was there, it was yours. Okay, and after you sold it, everything was in your control. Now, why did you lie saying that you have given all the possessions to the church? That was the problem. It was not that he kept something back, but the fact that he lied or he demonstrated a lack of integrity. And uh, Peter, by the operation of the word of knowledge, is confronting Ananias on this matter. And he's also rebuking him uh, because towards the end of his uh, uh, statements, he says, you have not lied to men, but to God. So he is rebuking him and he's accusing him of uh, doing something inappropriate. Uh, but let's see Ananias' response in verse 5. When Ananias hears these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Now, we don't know what was in his heart. And, uh, you know, why such a thing has happened, it's uh, what we call as judgment, right? So uh, in that very moment, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. So uh, we are not told very many things that were, you know, discussed ahead of this, done ahead of this, and how Ananias really pre-planned all this. But uh, mostly, Ananias wanted to gain uh, fame he wanted to be noted as a noble person among the church folk so maybe that is why he did what he did but it was uh, very evil in god's sight and uh, there was judgment right at the moment when peter uh, rebukes him ananias fell down and breathed his last is what the Bible tells us. So uh, we understand here that in times of uh, great power, when the Spirit of God is moving powerfully, uh, and sometimes we use the term revival to describe that, uh, at times of great revival, the judgment is also quite severe, isn't it? Because we experience the presence of God in a heightened way. We experience the works of the Holy Spirit in a very powerful way. But at that time, when there is sin uh, in the midst of the move of God, uh, there is quite a strong judgment. Or uh, the way we noticed, you know, there is a punishment for the wrong that Ananias's heart, uh, uh, you know, uh, conceived and uh, performed. So this is something for us to note. At a time of revival, the judgment also seems to be quite severe. So then when such a thing happened, great fear came upon all those who heard these things, obviously, because everything was going so well. But now, uh, all of a sudden, this has happened. Uh, there is a man who died at the rebuke of the apostles. Uh, and so people are gripped with fear. Uh, and when something like this happened, you know, the young men of the church, they arose, they wrapped him up, carried him out and buried him, as would have been their practice. So they are just doing uh, the needful in a situation like this. Uh, now, after about three hours, we are told that Ananias' wife came in yeah, and she did not know what had happened. So the uh, chain of events would have been very quick. So he died, they quickly took him, and uh, maybe news couldn't travel that fast those days. We don't know why there was a delay. But she comes into the church without the knowledge of her husband having died, uh, you know, a couple of hours ago. And uh, Peter is asking her as well, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. So uh, immediately she says, yes, for so much. Now again, the lack of integrity you know, uh, shared by both the husband and wife was something that God did not like. Now, we have learned in scripture that there is power in agreement. 
we have learned in scripture that you know it, it is god who brings people together and you know uh, the marriage covenant and agreeing together in marriage is so powerful um, uh, it can you know release the power of god however in this situation unfortunately they have agreed for the wrong matter which did not please god so uh, yes the husband was wrong but there was an opportunity for the wife to speak the truth but she has joined together with the lie which ananias had spoken and uh, this was definitely not pleasing in the sight of god and so what is her fate now peter again by the holy spirit he recognizes that she is not speaking the truth so he asks her in verse 9 how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of god look the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out that immediately she fell out at his feet and breathed her last so judgment to very severe judgment of a uh, uh, in this case a couple who uh, lacked integrity or honesty and uh, this happened in a matter of moments uh, and you know they had to be uh, buried uh, on the same day and when such a thing happened verse 11 says great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things so it was um, uh, really a matter that created fear in people's hearts fear of god uh, because they understood that you know they cannot uh, cheat god or they cannot um, uh, lie to god isn't it so at a time when the presence of god is so powerful unfortunately people were functioning in their flesh but god did not ignore that and there was an immediate judgment upon these people so i'm just going to stop to ask uh, all of you if there is anything that you are thinking at this moment you want to share your thoughts regarding this uh, situation um i'm pastor is this um and it's just a request i don't make it is right to ask also but um do we see that god was very uh, strict in the early church or uh, is is grace more about me right now god is not uh, doing it with that severity right now uh so one thing we know john is that our god um he is a very gracious god you know all along the very fact that adam and eve sinned and uh, he sent his only son to redeem us uh, and he had a plan to redeem us reveals how much god loves us and it also shows us that uh, his plan is to redeem every situation um, like hebrews 7:25 he saves to the uttermost the scripture says so uh, it is my belief that though it seems like in this particular incident that there was no opportunity for ananias and sapphira to respond and you know god didn't god was too strict with them um uh, or you know in that period maybe grace uh, is not looking that uh, abundant my feeling is i'm sure god would have dealt with their hearts before this but uh it would be a matter of uh, uh, uh you know hardening their hearts and not responding to god over a long period of time uh, which all those details we don't have because you see uh, god is the one uh, who who is a righteous judge isn't it he's enthroned on righteousness and justice uh, scriptures tell us so if he's a god of justice uh, definitely he will not do anything unjust so if the if this has transpired in a moment i don't think it's so much about the the availability of grace i think it's more about these two individuals and their journey with god they may not have responded to multiple prompts by god and so you know it finally ended up like this they would have received the grace of god is what i feel so what uh, i mean what do you think john yeah it should be right boss yeah 
yeah, yeah. He's uh, enthroned on righteousness uh, and, and justice. So obviously, uh, the most uh, righteous king would never do anything which uh, you know is uh, like it goes at anything that goes against his own nature. So yeah, that's my thing. good question, John. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. Uh, so we see in this scripture that uh, so he actually bought a certain part of it. Uh, he didn't give the full part of it. That's that's the thing. Uh, am I being right? Uh, so he actually bought certain part of his land, the money, but he kept something to himself. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, uh, but I just want to know where he actually lied, or or is it a rule like? Uh, we should give the full amount. Is there is there a rule like that? Because I don't know where he lied. And I also want to ask, uh, is lying that big sin? <laughs> is lying that big sin? Because uh, uh, is it mean? I mean, I don't think no one has lied in their life. Uh, I think we, we all do at certain points. But uh, does it mean? really talks about lying or it talks about not being honest to God, like lying in front of God. Okay. So, uh, yes, Jathina, uh, your first question was uh, like, do we need to give everything to God? Is keeping something back uh, an issue? But I don't think that is the issue here uh, because Peter quite clearly says in verse 4, while it remained, was it not your own? So it was a decision that Ananias had to make. Unfortunately, he was trying to paint a wrong picture. It's not about the amount of money. Now, let's say, you know, uh, um, he sold the land and he decided that he only wants to give a part of the money. He could have just you know, revealed to the people around or the apostles that he is giving a part of the money. But what he tried to do is, he is trying to show as if he has given everything to look good in front of people, okay, which was the problem. So God is not telling us that at any point in time we can, we have to give everything to him. Now, even when you go back to the construction of the temple um, uh, and the instructions that were given or the tabernacle, God told people to give what they can. He said, whatever each one can, let them give. So you never see a compulsion upon the people to uh, give beyond their capacity. So that, that is not something we observe uh, you know, as a pattern. So that we have to keep in mind. I hope it answers your first question. The second question that you asked is, is uh, uh, lying uh, you know, a big sin? See, when we consider God, uh, he's the God who said, be holy as I am holy. So when we compare any form of sin with holiness, it is not acceptable. Someone once gave an illustration. If you take a very white sheet of paper and uh, there's just a very tiny ink dot on that piece of paper, it, it will get noticed. Even if it is so tiny, it will get noticed because the rest of the paper is so white. So it's somewhat like that. When we think about God, it's not the extent of the sin. The very fact that it is sin, it is uh, uh, away from God's nature. It is away from uh, the way things must be done. It's contradicting the person of God and the nature of God. So it's not acceptable by God, any sin. So we can even talk about uh, the Garden of Eden. We can say, you know, just one, God told them not to take that fruit, but then they went and took it. So what is so wrong with that? They just made one mistake. And for that, you know, the whole world has come under the corruption of sin. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, so many things changed because of one decision. Right? But it's not so much about you know, one decision or a big or small sin, sin is sin. And sin uh, is unacceptable by God, okay? no, matter, no matter how big or small it is. Uh, and uh, which is why, you know, if, if there's anything that we are being convicted of, uh, even if it is a tiny thing, 
we have to repent and uh, uh, you know come clean before God because sin separates us from God, right? and we don't want that to happen. I, I hope I've answered your question. Uh, no, just want to know one more thing. So in in verse two, we see that he brought only a portion of it. I just want to know in which scripture it says that he he pictured it like uh, he bought everything in where in the. Yeah. So see, it's implied. Uh, we don't have a scripture which says that. Um, uh, you know, he he. Uh, just come again in your own words. Yes. And yeah, like as if he tried to uh, make himself look good. Where does it say that? It doesn't say uh, that he tried doing that, but we can understand from this passage because uh, in verse 2, it says he kept back part of the proceeds. His, his wife also being aware of it okay, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he has done this. Now, Peter, when he is speaking, we know it's coming across like a rebuke. And he's asking questions. You kept back a part of a price of the land for yourself. It is the reality. It is the reality. But why does Peter have to confront about a reality? Because the person has uh, made it look like something else was done. So it, it's quite basically like, you know, it's implied or after reading the passage, we can come to that conclusion that he may have uh, lied to the apostles. So that's how. Okay, Roslyn, uh, Pastor, what if your boss asks you mm -hmm. to lie to the client at workplace? What should be our stand at that time? I come across the situation often. My friends ask me. Uh, so, Rosalind, obviously we shouldn't lie. That is the answer. So, if a boss asks, a boss asks us to lie, uh, we would need to say that uh, you know we won't be able to do that. I know it's so tricky. It's uh, uh, you know you're at uh, risk of losing your job, but that's your decision to make. Uh, it's like Joseph, isn't it? Joseph, who was trying to live with integrity when uh, the situation was not easy for him, isn't it? In Potiphar's house, he was under pressure. But uh, we see how he says when Potiphar's wife, uh, this is uh, this is a different circumstance when he's coming under temptation. But he makes a statement and he says, you know, I cannot, um, I cannot sin against God. So even when we are asked to do something uh, dishonest by our higher authorities, uh, we cannot sin against God. So we need to carry that resolve and that determination in our hearts. Uh, and uh, it's going to be tricky to let them know, uh, but God can still give the wisdom for us to come out of this situation. Yeah. Okay. Sure. It's just thank you, Mister. All right. Um, any other doubts, questions regarding this uh, occurrence? I know it's so out of place in the Book of Acts when everything is going so wonderful. Suddenly, uh, two people are judged and they fall dead in moments. So it's quite uh, difficult to even accept what's going on. But the works of the flesh are evident even at the time when the work of the Holy Spirit is so powerful in the church. So let's look ahead and see what happens as a result of, uh, uh, or not really as a result, but after these things take place, uh, we saw that the fear, there was fear among all the people, great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. What else was going on? Let's read from verse 12 to verse 16. I request another person to please go ahead and read it.
okay, class, we have to buck up. We are in the book of acts, uh, you know, full of fire. So this book is all about fire. So I, I want some, you know, fire from your side. So as soon as we finish one section, uh, somebody can quickly just jump in and read the next section. So now we are uh, at verse 12, verses 12 to 16. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all <clears throat> with one accord in solving sports. Yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of men, both men and women. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. That at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on them. Also, a multitude gathered from uh, the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick, sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Wow, that is so powerful. So we see the uh, in the years that um, went by after starting with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the church is becoming spiritually very strong. Uh, how? What are some characteristics that make them strong? Uh, they are a people of prayer. They are a people given to the doctrine of the apostles. They are a people of fellowship. They are a people open to the works of the Holy Spirit. We can see the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, particularly now we saw Peter, how through a word of knowledge, he is leading the church, guiding the church in the right direction. So there is so much going on in the church. And these are incredible times because the church is walking in the fulfillment of what Jesus had promised. He had told them in Acts 1, 8, and you shall receive power from on high and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So uh, the difference happened after this power that they received from on high that was the baptism in the holy spirit and what else do we see we see a manifestation of the power of god among god's people in this section uh, we are uh, noticing how god used the apostles but later on we will also observe believers in the church moving in the power of the holy spirit so the signs wonders miracles are not limited only to the apostles but uh, in this section luke is recording that the apostles or the leaders of the church were people who were moving in the power of the holy spirit and what happened you no know, signs wonders were done among the people and they were all with one accord remember i said that oneness of heart fellowship uh, uh, that was it continued with the people even though a situation like ananias and sapphira has happened um, then what else we see that these people or the church was highly esteemed even though uh, none of the rest dared to join them who are the none of the rest it's likely that they were jews who heard the message of jesus but maybe they didn't have the courage or the conviction to or uh, they did not respond to the conviction of the holy spirit to accept christ to their own life so they did not join the church but one good thing is that the church was highly esteemed or respected that's a powerful place so the church is strong spiritually but the church is also strong in the community because there is a respect which they are gaining from the uh, uh, you know surrounding communities and uh, uh, we see that the church is growing in terms of numbers as well so that's another strength of the church it's increasingly um, uh, you know people were increasingly added uh, to the church and uh, we are told multitudes of men and women so we can picture that uh, there is a church and then every sunday there are more first time visitors you know less seats and uh, you know place is kind of becoming less and we need ushers to be a little bit more uh, uh, sort of uh, you know plan plan better and organize themselves better because the church is filling up and the church is overflowing maybe they were thinking about second service and third service and overflow area uh, obviously they didn't have live stream right but uh, they are trying to manage the growth of the church the church is really becoming uh, so strong during these 
times and the powerful works of the holy spirit are continuing because uh, sick people are being healed now where are these sick people coming from we are told that they were brought right they were brought and uh, uh, they were even out in the streets laid them on beds and couches i don't know how many of you have attended crusades uh, in, here in our uh, city at least in my observation it's sort of the thing of the past we don't have so many crusades anymore as much as we used to have when i was a kid and uh, I have attended some crusades back in those years uh, oh, uh, when permissions were easier. And I attended one particular crusade which was uh, uh, conducted by a healing minister. And uh, at that uh, point, I was uh, working for, uh, I mean, obviously I was a little older and I uh, was working in a hospital. So part of the hospital team, they had put us in charge of uh, an area that was given only for the sick people. So. That was the first time in my life that I saw so many sick people who had gathered. And that's the picture that comes to my mind when I see verse 15, where it says the sick uh, were brought out into the streets uh, and you know they were all gathered together. Why would somebody do this? At least at the crusade that I went to, uh, people had heard that healings take place, miracles take place. So they had made great effort to bring their sick people. In fact, I saw some on the stretchers, you know, with the, uh, with the uh, IV lines uh, and uh, along with doctors, even like the doctor, nurse, they had all come. Uh, so it was amazing to see that people had so much faith to actually be healed of their sicknesses and they had gathered to uh, experience the touch of God, the power of God. Um, so uh, in the times of the book of Acts, it's so similar uh, to that scene when there are so many sick people they have gathered that only goes to tell us that there was an expectation from the apostles that uh, these guys, when they come and they lay hands or they speak a word or you know whichever way they minister it, healings will take place so the sick had gathered uh, and uh, even on beds and couches right so so many people had actually gathered and the way god worked uh, is out of the box we are told that the shadow of peter passing by might fall on some of them so even the shadow of peter was healing now this also teaches a lesson uh, as far as the healing ministry is concerned uh, God can work however he pleases. We have generally heard of uh, methods such as laying hands or speaking a uh, you know, command over the sickness. We've even heard about using things, um, anointing oil uh, or uh, you know, pray over, or over something and lay it upon the sick person. So these are all common practices in the, in the church. But think about this, an unusual miracle was taking place and that is people were getting healed by the shadow of peter which is a non-material thing it's not even material okay so how do you explain this phenomenon uh, we cannot explain it so the point is in various uh, times of the move of the holy spirit god can minister however he likes so even when we study revivals we observe that uh, uh, the manifestation is so different. Uh, the way people got healed is so different in each of these these uh, revivals or uh, you know so each of the services, each of the meetings. Um, uh, Maria Woodworth Etta, if you have read about her meetings, there was an unusual manifestation, and uh, one of which was that uh, in the presence of God, she would she would just go into a trance for hours, and uh, it is said that even maybe. You know, over a couple of days, she would just be like a statue. Uh, how can that happen? Uh, we don't understand these things. God can work any way in which he likes. So we are no one to tell God what to do and exactly how to do it. But when these things take place by the fruit of what is um, occurring, we are able to tell whether something is God or it is not God. So the manifestations are unusual in this particular situation. In verse 16, you know, a, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So it tells us that 
the fame of the church of jerusalem spread far and wide beyond the city imagine imagine a city where uh, god's presence is incredible to the extent where people from surrounding cities you know they are buying train tickets and bus tickets and you know maybe even flight why they just want to go to this city where the church is uh, and they want to bring their sick people they want to bring their tormented people because something is happening there uh, and god is uh, on the move and uh, the power of god uh, is is manifesting and the people of god are moving in signs wonders and miracles it's amazing to even think of a time like this and uh, for us you know we may feel like wow i, I wish uh, i was part of those years when these things were taking place but the beauty is that uh, god has not uh, spoken anywhere in his word and, and said that this is only limited to the early church in fact uh, we could consider this as a time when uh, god was revealing how the church is meant to be uh, and uh, the early church is really a prototype church where we can look at it and uh, desire for our churches to be like this that people will come from far and wide when they hear hey lives are getting transformed in that church uh, sickness is getting healed in that church demons are fleeing in this church come on let's go even if it's a sunday far away let's just go let's experience the power of god and that is the picture of the early church that we have okay uh, any thoughts any comments before we uh, move ahead into the next section All right, um, so let's uh, continue then. Let's see what is happening. You know, whenever something good is happening, um, we we are rejoicing in it. But there is also uh, uh, like an opposition that is rising against the church uh, among those who don't believe. So unfortunately, even at this point, we notice that uh, the authorities were noticing uh, all that was going on. Uh, at the church of jerusalem and they came against the church so let's read the section from verse 17 all the way uh, till maybe till verse 21 and then we get you know, move on to the next passage verse 17 then the high priest rose up and all those who were with no him, which is the sect of the sadducees and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison but at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought in. All right, so just when you think uh, everything is fine, again, there's a, another challenge to face. So what is this challenge? The authorities uh, see a threat uh, in what's going on. So the high priest, he rises up uh, and uh, uh, he was filled with indignation, it says, which is anger. He was very angry and laid hands. Laid hands is to seize or to catch the uh, apostles and put them in the prison now once they are put in the prison uh notice that whatever is going on in the church is not just the leaders and the people it's also god who is working with them so uh sometimes we may feel like the minority we may feel like hey i'm feeling so alone doing god's work um but we are not alone that's the whole point uh, so I just want to share also, uh, whenever I, I, share, I, I talk about this, I remember uh, we have uh, some, uh, uh, we have a campus uh, ministry. Uh, it was known as uh, Campus Elevates. We used to go to colleges and get permission and all that. So at one point, uh, I remember uh, we had, like I had one more person uh, who would go with me uh, to the colleges, but uh, there, were, there were times when uh, she was busy and so she said, hey, Nancy, can you go? I can't go with you. 
so i remember walking into these huge institutions trying to go to the you know principal's office the admin office but i'm alone over there right and i would think god i'm alone and i have to do this alone uh, it it's quite a uh, intimidating scary thought but i was always reminded you know when we serve the lord even though physically we may sense that we're alone and we have to take the work forward by ourselves we are actually not alone we we have the presence of the holy spirit and we have the host of angels we have god himself who's looking into the work that we are doing and so when we are uh, moving as per the purposes of god we see his intervention whether it is through a uh, uh, wis the uh, word of wisdom that he gives us in that circumstance or uh, even to let's say send uh, an angel in that moment or uh, send people to come and assist us so we are never alone in the work of god that's the point that i want to make for us so when these apostles were caught by uh, uh, the high priest what happened in the night an angel of the lord opened the prison doors look at that so this is team work we are working with heaven and so god is sending angels to deliver his uh, people so they came and opened the prison doors wow i it, it's like you i i know there's already a movie but <laughs> you could make another movie isn't it because so dramatic the things that are going on uh in the lives of god's people so there is the prison in one at one moment and another moment uh divine intervention angelic intervention the angels go they open the prison doors and bring them out okay uh, but it wasn't just that there was an instruction by the angels so sometimes god uses angels uh, to minister instructions to us the angels may appear physically uh, and uh, provide these instructions or the angels may be a part of a vision or they may part of be part of a dream delivering a message to us so these are all ways in which god guides us and he speaks to us so notice how the acts of the apostles is actually the acts of the holy spirit the acts of god that are continuing you know passage by passage incident by incident so god is working at this time through the angels so the angel has come and uh, the angel is giving an instruction what is the instruction go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life and you're thinking what is this instruction we have to escape right now and protect ourselves save ourselves and the angel is telling us go back into the uh, you know like the front lines the war zone get back into the war zone that doesn't sound like god is calling you into safety isn't it uh, but god has a purpose so when god leads us it's according to his purpose uh, and yes he will protect us he will take care of us but we have to follow the instructions of god think about the apostles at this time they were in prison so were they scared uh, maybe they were but the instruction is go back to the temple right and speak to the people all the words of this life so putting themselves again in a sort of a dangerous situation but that's what god wants from them so according to god's instructions they heard they entered the temple early in the morning wow that means there were people with fire and passion if they were not excited about it they would go like you know wake up at 10 am and then go but uh, the point we see here is they entered the temple early in the morning meaning they were excited they were passionate about the work of god so they showed up and they did the work that god wanted them to do uh, but you know once again the high priest came uh, and called the council and uh, you know they were brought to be tried so we we'll look at that trial uh, pretty soon let's take a break now and uh, let's meet in 10 minutes to continue thank you